Hello and welcome to Chapter 1 of Microeconomics. Uh, this is the OpenStax uh, Rice University text that was provided to each of y'all. Uh, my purpose will not be so much to read the slides, but rather offer insights to commentaries or illustrations made within the slides and to try and round out the concepts verbally. Likewise, I will also denote what might be considered important to know for a test or used for maybe some other purpose such as a discussion forum or a paper. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with that. And you have the four main uh, questions that come up in the outline, which is what is economics and why is it important? The uh, difference between micro and macroeconomics and how economists use theories and models and how to organize economies. So these are this will be pretty much the content of this presentation. And so what the slide is saying is that you know economics is a study of how humans make uh, decisions in the face of security, meaning that uh, effectively there are limitations on resources. Uh, and, you know, if there is a, if resources are plentiful, uh, then they are less scarce. And so uh, there's, we'll say, adequate supply or maybe even oversupply. At the same time, uh, whether something's scarce or not depends on demand, which means the demand for the good or service also will it, yeah, also dictate how scarce it is. If nobody wants the product, then it's no longer scarce, even if you have some just laying around gathering dust. But rather, if, uh, you know, say you have something that is, let's say, highly coveted, uh, th then there will be a lot of competition for it, and so the good will be scarce. All these things impact uh, human buying and the monetary behavior. Uh, the FRED, this is something you want to get familiar with. It includes data on 40, you know, 400,000 domestic and international economic and social variables uh, over time, which will be used in this course. Don't let that scare you because uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about FRED, which is actually the uh, Federal Reserve's database that has all kinds of great information in there which you can use. Uh, economics in the social media age, uh, because communications, you know, are much quicker and pretty much instantaneous, more so now than ever before. Um, you know, news, good or bad, you know, tends to hit, you know, other recipients, gets passed around uh, a great deal quicker than maybe, let's say, 50 years ago before the advent of uh smartphones or other mediums, or let's say even email. Scarcity, well, you know, homeless people are a stark reminder of the scarcity of resources. And actually, you know, this is something that we're ha is happening right now. If you take a look at what's going on in many of the West Coast states, uh, the city of San Francisco has a real scarcity of housing. And so actually more specifically has a scarcity of affordable housing. So you want to probably think to yourself, what are some examples of critical goods and services? And with the COVID uh, virus, uh, you know, in play right now, I'd say one of them for some reason or another happens to be toilet paper. There are others, but you know sometimes things that don't make 100% sense uh, you know, become a high demand item, and they become quickly scarce as a result. Adam Smith is actually considered one of the guys who pretty much uh, created the notion of economics, or the, or, and he had a book in 1776 called The Wealth of Nations. And so you'll hear the reference to the invisible hand in his particular case. The invisible hand basically is it's not because, you know, all, all the people who have goods and services or money, you know, are 
doing uh, benevolent things for the people under, you know, underneath them and let's say, you know, lower socioeconomic orders, but rather it's, you know, the fact that these guys enjoy, let's say, a good life. You know, the guy needs labor, so it provides jobs. The guy needs, you know, services, you know, which also provides jobs. So it is... Uh, kind of like one hand, you know, feeds the other type of thing, and that's called the invisible hand. The vision of specialization of labor is something that's been a recent advent, uh, actually at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this has really been something that uh, has gotten more and more uh, specific on what people do. Uh, workers on an assembly line is kind of a division of labor, although that is a that is you know somewhat disappearing being replaced with robots and artificial intelligence okay why does the divisional labor you know increase production basically kind of simplify the task each worker has to do and also it allows businesses to take advantage of economy scale micro and macroeconomics Basically, the one way you can look at microeconomics is the following. It is the behavior of the firm and the individual. Macroeconomics is the branch that focuses on the overall growth, employment picture, inflation, and trade balances of nations. So when we talk about GDP, we're referring to a macroeconomic concept we could be talking about, uh, let's say, Amazon, which is nearly a trillion dollar company. However, that falls neatly within the realm of microeconomics, although there are these super companies that could have macroeconomic impact, just the same. So uh, the line is distinct, but not entirely so. Monetary policy talks about you know, how the central bank or any nation's central bank uh, wants to make money available for the economy. So it's basically they control interest rates, they control the supply of money, and that to and the extent of borrowing. Fiscal policy basically is about uh, spending and taxes and usually determined by a legislative body within that, you know, governing country. A note on this, uh, basically I'd like to say taxation is a socioeconomic behavior modifier, meaning that people are incented to, you know, do certain behaviors as a result of how they're taxed. And so some, if you, you can do anything you want, but you just have to be willing to pay for it in terms of taxes. So many of the uh, incentives are built within tax code, such as uh, green energy and other things that you get tax credits for. So there's a push for that. If you decide to behave in that direction, you are a beneficiary. Whereas if you like your old gas guzzler that gets eight you know, miles to the gallon, well, that's going to probably come back to you in the form of taxes, more expensive gas, inefficiencies, so on and so forth. How do economists use theories and models to understand economic issues? A famous economist, one of note, is John Maynard Keynes. He is somebody who believes government uh, is pretty much uh, the driver of all economic activity. Uh, Keynes also said it teaches you how to think, not what to think, with respect to how the economy runs. A theory is a simplified representation on two or more variables interact with each other. So this is a generality, almost axiomatic. A good theory is simple enough to understand while complex enough to capture the key features or objects situation you're studying. Models are basically the test of those theories. And there's a circular flow diagram. Might want to remember this for the test. Where you have, you know, on the uh, the between household and firms, basically what you have are consumers and producers. 
Households are typically uh, consumers, firms, typically producers. So you can keep that in mind. And so it is a circular flow and you know, goods and services market households receive goods and services and pay firms for them in the labor market households provide labor and receive payment from the firms to wages and salaries and benefits something to say about this particular slide it is also known that like today there is a general complaint especially in this political sphere that there is too much disparity between labor and let's say the top class monetarily let's say the famed one percent and there's not much in the middle uh, that is a problem because if uh, companies no longer have a demographic that can afford their product then it will be difficult for them to generate the sales to keep them in business so uh, there is kind of a dysfunctional relationship uh, today with respect to workers and large business in terms of, you know, creating good jobs. A traditional economy is an agrarian economy and things pretty much are static. You know, we've always done it this way and it's the oldest economic uh, system. Uh, it is prevalent in Asia, Africa, and South Af America, where you have basically third tier economic uh, uh, nations. Uh, occupations are passed on from father to son, typically. What you produce is what you consume, little economic progress or development. Command economy is where economic um, economic decisions are passed down from government authority and the government has its own resources so they'll decide what gov you know things are you know dispersed to the public in terms of goods and services they decide the methods of productions the wages and uh, government provides a necessity like health care and uh, education Think about the the, uh, the national election, the presidential election, and think about this group of statements. Which which candidate is the embodiment of this idea? An overview of economic systems, uh, the command economy. You could take ancient Egypt, medieval manor life, communism. And so we're talking about Cuba, North Korea. It's basically a totalitarian regime, pretty much in modern times. An overview of economic systems. Market economy is where decisions are decentralized. And uh, basically, it is a you know, free floating uh, supply and demand situation. The market is basically the people who are, are potential buyers and sellers. And so the interaction between the two of them help define what is, you know, the actual demand and supply and whether those things are being met. Private enterprise is where groups of individuals or an individual will, you know, operate the means of production. And I guess the uh, big, uh, the, the big uh, market is the stock market. That's probably the glaring example I want to point out in this particular slide. Most economies in the real world are mixed, so they have some elements of the uh, three mentioned before. The U.S. economy is more market oriented. Uh, Europe, Latin America, they're market oriented, but they have, let's say, a greater deal of government involvement in economic decisions in the U.S. economy. Uh, things like the uh, train service airlines, the postal, tele tele uh, postal telegraph and telegram uh, service in many of these countries are state-owned. Russia and China, they've moved more in the direction of having a market oriented uh, system, but uh, basically the guys at the top are calling all the shots. Regulations, basically the rules of engagement. 
There's no such thing as an absolutely free market. Regulations do define the rule of the game in the economy. Economies are primarily market-oriented, have fewer regulations. So the idea of reducing regulations, let's say, in our economy, was a, basically a move to drive it to be more market-oriented rather than centrally uh, governed by the, by the uh, government. Heavily regulated con uh, economies also have uh, shadow economies or black markets. And basically, they don't want to deal with all the bureaucracy or, or the big brother effect. They just simply uh, make transactions, you know, pretty much off grid. The rise of global globalization. This is an idea that many of the, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, uh, many uh, countries and many uh, leaders of larger industrialized nations are looking to globalize the economy where they can use the synergies of inexpensive labor of one country to produce goods and sell them in more developed countries and increase the uh, margin of profit. Um, this is not necess this can be a good thing, but generally speaking, since we have globalized to some extent, it has not been a benefit because uh, people, you know, if you take a, a good or a service, let's say you take an engineer and you give him an H-1B visa, and he works for about 40% of what a uh, U.S. Uh, software engineer would work for, um, basically what you do is you're undercoating your own uh, workforce and the demand for that workforce and the ability for that part of the segment of the workforce to earn. So once again, you're in a situation where they have less spending power. The global economy, basically it's uh, the shipment or let's say the transportation of goods back and forth between countries or just uh, world free trade. And so think about examples of products and services in the modern economy and how's, how have they contributed to this globalization. Um, Think Amazon, think uh, DHL or UPS. Uh, think about the shipping lines. Think about where a lot of our products are made instead of in our elsewhere, instead of in our own country. These are things that would uh, be attributed in this slide. Uh, this ends chapter one. Thank you for your attention.